The American Civil War was the most devastating war in American history. Over 625,000 men died during the war, decimating nearly 2% of the population at that time. The war's effects were felt all around the world, and nowhere more so than in Great Britain. British armories made guns for both the North and the South. British shipyards built warships and blockade runners for the Confederacy. And the Confederate trading embargo was causing economic problems in Britain's textile mills. At the outbreak of war, the United States Commanding General Winfield Scott proposed a very bold plan, which he named the Anaconda Plan. General Scott's idea was to use the Union Navy to take control of the Mississippi River, cutting the main states of the Confederacy off from supplies in the west. Then the Union Navy would blockade the southern ports on the east coast and around the Gulf of Mexico. By 1864, the Union's blockade of the southern ports was well established. Now in its third year, the Union Navy was working hard at its aim, starve the Confederacy of essential supplies and subduing the rebellion. On Monday, the 4th of July, 1864, the London Times ran an article named How to Run the Blockade. Wilmington, North Carolina, June 6th. It is difficult for an Englishman who desires to pierce the American blockade to decide which of the available routes offers the greatest facilities and attractions. My own experience during the present year would seem to prove that, as regards time, there is very little choice between land and water. Upon the 17th of last January, I started from Richmond, and making my way across the Potomac and passing rapidly through Washington and New York, stood upon British soil upon the 6th of February, that is to say, upon the 20th day after my departure from Secessia. Upon the 15th of May, I left Queenstown, and, passing through Halifax and Bermuda, found the vessel which carried me from Bermuda safely moored in Cape Fear River, upon which Wilmington stands, on the night of the 4th of June. That is again to say, upon the 20th day after my departure from England. But unquestionably, as regards to the endurance of fatigue and the facility for conveyancing luggage, the sea's route is infinitely preferable to land, and is attained with less personal jeopardy, although there is a certain mauvais quarter experienced at the moment of passing inside the blockading squadron, which in intensity of excitement can hardly be surpassed. The unnamed writer was none other than the Honourable Francis C. Lawley, whom was one of the Times' war correspondents and a relation to the four-time Prime Minister, William Gladstone. In the article, the trip from the Confederacy to British territory is considered to be a triviality, far more a vacation trip than a hazardous journey. He chronicled in great detail his return trip to Sassacia, the less used name for the Confederate States. Mr. Lawley intended to return in May 1864 and found himself needing to run the blockade again to return him to General Lee's headquarters. Leaving from Bermuda, he was faced with the choice of traveling on the Lillian or Flory. Both of these blockade runners had been made by Messrs. Thompson of Glasgow. Both ships were excellent sea vessels with very little in the way of armament, relying on speed to escape pursuit, and both were headed for Wilmington. Mr. Lawley chose the Lillian, probably for his choice of commander, John Newland Muffet. To many an English reader, the name of Captain Maffitt, lately in command of the Confederate cruiser Florida, is well known as having assisted Captain Semmes and the Alabama to demonstrate the two light and, as regards equipment, comparatively insignificant vessels of war would have little difficulty in driving from the ocean a flag which three years ago might have been seen upon every wave of every sea. It is remarked that this is a lesson to which, of all nations, England can least afford to be blind. John Newland Maffitt was the son of an immigrant Irish couple. Born at sea, it seemed that his life would be dominated by the waves. Serving 31 years in the US Navy, he rose from midshipman to the rank of commander before secession came. In 1861, he resigned his commission and became Robert E. Lee's naval aide. On August 17, 1862, he became the first commander of the CSS Florida, a Confederate cruiser which earned great infamy during the war. Built by William Miller and Sons in Liverpool, in the three years she was on the open seas, she took 37 prize ships. It was during this time as commander of the Florida that Maffitt became known as the Prince of the Privateers. On February 12, 1864, Maffitt was forced to relinquish the command of the Florida at Brest in France due to his ill health. However, by the June of that year, he was too trying to return to the Confederacy after a full recovery. Lawley described both ships as a credit to their builders and described the journey as being largely uneventful. One incident of note happened about 200 miles from Wilmington when the Lillian spied smoke on the horizon. 
Maffet changed course to provide aid, commenting, the ship that leaves a companion at sea in distress must be so cursed. The smoke turned out to be a federal cruiser creating a mass of smoke from its boiler in pursuit of another, delinquent blockade runner. With quick wits, Maffet changed course, unnoticed by the preoccupied federal ship. The Lillian then continued for 16 hours without incident until approaching the inner squadron blockade in Wilmington, and another cruiser attempted to intercept the ship. Maffet changed course and using the Lillian's impressive speed was able to outrun the ship. Then under cover of dark, she slipped back past the squadron and under the protection of Fort Fisher. But what can be gleaned from this perspective of the war? What does it say about the British attitude to what was happening in America? Mr. Lawley summarizes perfectly. It is the opinion of every English officer who has been to the southern states that there is infinitely more to be learned here during a month than in the north during a year. It is pretty well admitted by this time that as regards the construction of guns or the architecture of ironclad monitors, England has nothing to learn from the north. But in every other department of the vast science of war there is more to be gained as regards the present struggle by studying it from a southern than a northern point of view. A bold statement indeed. Lawley didn't admire the Union's war machine, but instead the Confederacy's inventiveness and their tenacity in the face of the overwhelming odds. If the press truly represents the opinions of its readership and is a vox populi, the voice of the people, then the American Civil War was truly a war of very British interest. <laughs>